Your name is Professor Dr. Howard Nicholas, a senior lecturer in economics at the International Institute of Social Science of the Erasmus University, Rotterdam, Holland. And Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that. Okay, we do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that. Countries are kept poor. Due to reparations, they are forced to pay to former colonial masters. The Haiti indemnity controversy comes to mind. Some are poor due to economic policies. French-speaking countries whose currencies and entire foreign exchange are managed by the French Treasury to date are in this category. 14 of the states are in West and Central Africa. When the colonizers were leaving the continent between 1958 and 1961, France did something that was just downright terrible. Made the African leaders sign what we, they call the, the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. France made the Francophone countries sign the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. Allow me to highlight a few of the items in the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. And I urge all of you to Google it and read it. And if that does not disgust you, I don't know what will. First, the French said, well, you see, we built a few schools, a few, a few roads, uh, a few hospitals, taught you about the fork and knife and sitting on a table and eating with utensils. We're going to call that the colonial debt. And for that you shall pay to pay treaty. In addition, you will deposit 85% of your bank reserves with the Minister of Finance, the French Minister of Finance. Collectively, the Minister of Finance, the French Minister of Finance, will take all your deposits. It was 85% back then. It's now down to about 60. The French Minister will invest that money in the French Stock Exchange under the French name. You may or may not know the returns. Should any of those countries wish to access some of their own money that they deposited with France? They have to submit their own financial reports for the country. And if approved, they can only access up to 20% of that money as a loan at commercial interest rates. Figure that one out. Most countries, however, are afflicted by this resource cause and a toxic mix of corruption learned helplessness and outside political interference to protect international access to resources like in Congo, Nigeria. This can be overcome, but we require doing what China, Brazil, Ethiopia, India did. Close the doors, invest in your people, then when you reopen, stack the deck to protect your own economy and create jobs. The other alternative is looping a vast number of poor people into a closed-loop financial system 
and jumpstart local growth and self-improvement through access to credit for productive activities to grow at high GDP rates with almost no foreign direct investment. Africa does do something different, I assure you living standards of all those in Europe and North America and Asia is going to fall. Okay? And that is a big price to pay. I assure you that the West is not going to allow that without a big fight. He was overthrown by British and American interest because he threatened oil interest of the British. And as a result of that, the Shah of Iran came in, terrible dictator. Whichever route you take, they must fight back with propagandas to demonize you or the struggle before your people and the world with their well-oiled propaganda machines like the BBC and their agents among your people. The only way they would stop is if you return to the status quo or accept to enter their death trap with your eyes open or promote a poor school curriculum, food insufficiency, adhere to the influences of the four evil creatures, IMF, World Bank, WTO, and United Nations. And this is a, this is a delicate one, and I tread carefully here, is the, the destruction of belief in Africa. The, the lack of self-confidence, the feeling that we, we can't do it. And I think that was also a result of the, of the colonial impact because I think it was short enough to destroy leadership in Africa. It was short, uh, but not long enough to replace it with anything else. So the old ways, the old political systems were just wiped out by the colonial impact. And with that, any form of, of um, political or, or cultural leadership was obliterated. And it is that loss of self-confidence, which I think was the other thing. I think Franz Fanon wrote a lot about this. Nigeria is the only country we have. We must therefore solve our problems ourselves. Sania Bacha loved his people. And that love shoe in his effort to liberate his people from the chains of neo-colonialism. In 1960, Nigeria became an independent nation. Thanks to the works and ingenuity of the founding fathers like Herbert Macaulay, Namdi Azikiwe, Amadou Bello and others. But as the years rolled by, the flaw in the system became evident. The hope for a better life after independence seemed a mirage despite the huge potentials in human and mineral resources like in the rest of West African states. There was a great need to hold the bull by the horn. The colonialists did not grant economic independence. By controlling trades and international relations with international institutions, putting their puppets in power, 
granting loans and aids with unfavorable conditions. As the reality became glaring, nationalists across the third world countries began to fight for true independence. Abacha regime in Nigeria was one of these regimes. The 1996-98 rolling plan which provides the base for the 1996 capital budget aims at building Nigeria's productive capacity and completing those projects which should free the economy from external dependence. I sincerely appeal to the international community for support in our endeavors. This administration does not shy away from well-meaning advice on political, economic and financial matters. We are prepared to listen, but if having listened, we make our decisions, we expect our true friends to concede that right to us. From November 1993, a new order was in place after the several attempts to achieve political and economic freedom. And the new order required a new set of rules. On 27th November 1996, a vision committee was set up to change the narratives of Nigeria's socio-economic woes. The committee's mandate was captured in a 14-item terms of reference. It had the former head of the interim national government, Chief Ernest Shonikon, a private sector player as chairman and about 248 persons from various sectors of the economy including 25 foreigners as members. Their mandate was clear, fashion out an economic blueprint that would lead the nation from poverty and underdevelopment to a democratically stable and economically prosperous nation within a period of about 14 years. Now that we have attained a modest level of stability, we are faced with the greater challenge of how to consolidate the gains we have recorded. We have to concretize our achievements and determine objectives for our country in the short, medium, and long term. In this regard, I'm proud to state that Nigeria is now ready to adopt a more systematic and carefully phased out approach to the development of the nation. Time is indeed right for us to have a definite vision of the type of society we want, especially one that is economically prosperous, politically stable, and socially harmonious. Properly defined, this vision should provide a strategic insight into the direction in which the nation needs to move as well as a proper focus on the formation of programs and policies we should lead us to the realization of the future of our dream. After about 10 months of deliberations in the nation's capital, Abuja, the committee came up with a plan that would lead to Nigerians' transformation into a united, industrial and politically stable society, committed to making the basic needs of life affordable for everyone. The Vision 2010 the plans of the document were organized under various areas such as education, health, industry, petroleum, solid minerals, agriculture, infrastructure, poverty alleviation, rural and urban development, unemployment, small and medium scale enterprises, public and private sector partnership, stable policy environment, law and order, anti-corruption, good governance, external image and capital mobilization. A year after receiving the plan, the GDP of Nigeria grew from $270 in 1993 to $480 in 1997. Unemployment declined from 4.10% in 1993 to 4.02%. Debt decreased from $36 billion in 1993 to $27 billion in 1997. Foreign reserves increased 
from 494 million dollars in 1993 to 9.6 billion dollars in 1997 inflation rates declined from 57.17 percent in 1993 to 8.53 percent in 1997 trade balance increased from 1.78 billion dollars in 1993 to 3.18 billion dollars in 1997 economy grew from 27.75 billion dollars in 1993 to 54.46 billion dollars in 1997 with massive investments in building new schools, libraries, hostels, roads, hospitals, etc. At this rate, the vision was achievable with determination and political discipline. And General Sani Abacha was ready to do that. Budget. I make sure that ministers are well controlled even when they are traveling. I make sure that I approve their traveling and I even approve the amount of money they will spend. You know any ex expenditure outside, you know, the budget itself? Even what is in the budget, I have to approve it. Extra budgetary expenditure, it must be absolutely necessary. But there was a problem. His major international allies like China, Turkey, Libya are not in the good books of the United States of America and her allies. America and her allies are known to effect regime changes through sponsored cubes, sponsored civil demonstrations, invasions, poisoning, elections, and assassinations in their bid to control the war and its resources. The U.S. has interfered is long. In 1893, the U.S. helped overthrow the Kingdom of Hawaii. Five years later, in 1898, the U.S. invaded and occupied Cuba and Puerto Rico. A year later, it was the Philippines. Early 20th century interventions included Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, all in the 1910s. Uh, in 1953, the U.S. helped overthrow the Iranian government. A year later, in 1954, the U.S. backed coup in Guatemala, overthrowing the democratically elected leader of Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz. Then in the 60s, the list grew to include once again the Dominican Republic, Indonesia, and the Congo. And that's just a partial list. Even with the end of the Cold War, U.S. interference overseas did not end. Next week marks the 15th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq to topple the government of... Abacha knew all this and took measures to avoid it. But on June 8, 1998, he died less than 18 hours he received the PLO leader, Yasser Arafat, and the presidential wing of the Namdi Azikiwe Airport, becoming one of the great African fallen heroes in the struggle to liberate Africa. Because I'm going to cheat, 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 I'm going to cheat